Hi, and thanks for joining us. Today we're going to talk about the Klingon language, everything from the real-world linguistic science that went into creating Klingon, to the sounds of Klingon, the grammar of Klingon, and even some of the backstory of how the Klingon language came to be the way that we know it now. My name is Tracy Canfield. My Klingon name is Yichatna, although as you can see in the picture, I'm not myself a, a Klingon. Um, and I'm the CEO of the USS Indiana up here in Indianapolis in Region 1. I have a PhD in computational linguistics, which is the branch of linguistics that uses computers to work with human languages. And I was called a Klingon scholar by CNN, because if you ever get out to the Janolan Caves in Australia and you hear their Klingon audio tour, I'm the voice actor on that. Yich Atnat is Klingon. And it means, initially, we weren't sure what this was, but on further inspection, it proved to be a truly enormous tribble. Mark Okrand is the linguist who created the Klingon language. That's him over on the right. And it wasn't actually his first Star Trek project. He had worked on the Wrath of Khan. There's a scene in the Wrath of Khan where Savik and Spock speak to each other in Vulcan. But that scene was actually originally shot in English. It was only after it was filmed that somebody said, wouldn't it make more sense for these two Vulcans to be speaking to each other in Vulcan? Now, it's less expensive to call the actors back in to re-record the dialogue than it is to reshoot the whole scene. So they hoped to change the these, these audio and have it be in uh, Vulcan, but they needed to make sure that whatever the actors were saying matched the lip movements that the audience could see on the screen. Because when there's a mismatch between the lips and the sound, it's kind of like when you're watching a badly dubbed movie. Things seem a little off. So Marco Ukrid was brought in to come up with sounds where the part of the vocal tract, the organs that we use to speak, that you can't see might be doing different things, but what we can see on the lips was the same. And he used this to create Vulcan dialogue that could be matched perfectly to what we see on screen, and that's the Vulcan dialogue that we hear there. Ogren said afterwards, well, you know, I taught Mr. Spock how to, how to speak Vulcan. That's the greatest thing a linguist could do in the track world, right? But little did he know that when the next movie, Star Trek Search for Spock, came around, and they wanted to have a lot of Klingon dialogue, that they would call him up and ask him to create the Klingon language. He didn't have a lot of specific instructions about creating it, just that Klingon was described as a harsh, guttural language. But what exactly do we mean when we say that. English speakers often describe German as sounding guttural or Russian as sounding harsh, but speakers of German and Russian don't hear them that way. What is it that, that goes into that impression of a language that Okrid could use to create Klingon? I think he succeeded. If you take a sentence like which means 4,000 throats may be cut in one night by a running man, you probably would describe that as harsh or guttural. Now, research has been done on words that English speakers think sound pretty versus words that people think sound ugly. If you look at these two lists, you'll quickly realize that the list on the left is going to be the positive ones, and the list on the right is negative. Part of that, of course, is what the words mean. Melody and gossamer are pleasant things. Uh, cacophony and flatulent aren't. Jazz doesn't seem so bad. But you'll also notice that there are some sounds that occur more on one side or the other. For example, over in the left-hand list, you see a lot of all and er sounds, which linguists call liquids. M mm and n mm sounds, those are nasals. And b and d, which we're going to come back to in a moment. On the right, there's a lot of k, g, p, and t. Now, it could just be the case that there are some sounds that people react to less positively, but we're actually going to be able to generalize a little more than that. Other people have used this uh, to uh, this kind of sound symbolism when they created other languages. So if you have one group of people that says things like elen sila lumen omentielvo, and another group that says things like Ash naz dobratuluk, ash naz gimbatul, ash naz krakatuluk, ag burzumishi krimpatul. You don't really need to be told that the first one is the good guys and the second one is the bad guys. 
And you'll notice, now that we've looked over that other list, how much m, n, ol is in that first one, and how much g, k, t is in the second. These are, in fact, Tolkien's Elvish and mortar speech. Now, when we say sounds like k, g, p, and t, what's happening is that air is flowing up from our lungs through the vocal tract, and whenever we speak, we're shaping that with movements of the, t the lips, the tongue, different parts inside of our mouth are touching each other, and that shapes the airflow, which affects the sound. And for these sounds, the flow of air stops altogether. It's cut off by one part of the mouth against another. We call that the point of articulation, where that cutoff is happening. Consonants uh, like this, um, if you look at uh, something on the right, that's called a spectrogram. And the dark bands show the frequencies of sounds in the imaginary word utu. You'll notice that there's that vertical white column there. That's where the airflow is cut off in the t sound in the middle. Consonants that do this are called stops. They can also be called occlusives. And k, g, p, and t are all stops. More specifically, k, p, and t are the voiceless stops of English, which means the vocal cords aren't vibrating. If you look again at that utu picture and that complete band of white, and then you look on other side of it, you'll see some dark vertical stripes that are very regularly spaced, and those are the regular vibrations of the vocal cords, and they're not happening during utu. If this was udu, you would see a little vibration even during the consonant. So uh, k is pronounced towards the back of the throat, p is pronounced on the lips, and t is pronounced on the bony ridge behind your teeth. Those are the three points of articulation we use in English for voiceless stops. B and d, which we saw in the sound symbols of examples, are voiced stops, and maybe they aren't as unpleasant. Uh, perhaps it's just that we don't have the impression of those being as choppy. Now, g is a voiced stop, like b and d and yet it's often re regarded kind of negatively, too. This seems to be because k and g are what we call velars. They're pronounced with the back of your tongue raised up towards the roof of your mouth. And it's some of these sounds that are pronounced farther back in, this, in, in the mouth that are described by people as guttural. A sound like h, which is also pronounced farther back and that we don't have in English, is one of the sounds that, that English speakers often find harsh in German. Okrin didn't want to use that k sound, though, because k had become such a stereotype by that, that point. It was so commonly used in, in science fiction villain names that he wanted to move away from it. Now, we mentioned that English uses three different points of articulation for, for stops, but other languages use other, other places in the mouth. For example, that little glob of flesh at the back of your mouth, that's called the uvula. And you can pronounce a stop consonant there. Some languages do. If you look at this map, the white dots are languages that don't have uvular stops, and the blue ones are languages that do. You'll notice that throughout Europe, the languages that you're most likely to have run into, none of them have a uvular stop. But in Central Asia, or in the Native American languages spoken in Northwest uh, North America, you, you see quite a few of them. It sounds like Ha or ho. And Klingon uses it in words like nuknech. You may have heard this. It literally means, what do you want? And since Klingon doesn't have a word for hello, because Klingons get to the point, this is often the first thing that you say to someone. If you tell people that, that you watch this video or that you're interested in Klingon, you'll start having some Star Trek fans come up to you and say, nuknech, and be kind of pleased with themselves. But that doesn't actually make a lot of sense to do. It really is the, should be the person that someone else came up to saying, So if somebody comes up and says this to you, you could say, What do you want? But this is a Starfleet event, and Starfleet is about understanding, and so if it's meant in a friendly way, I would encourage you to take it in a friendly way. Another place that you can produce stops is at the epiglottis, and if you look at the uh, uh, tongue, and kind of to the right in this cross-section, 
you can see how that can just um, cut off the flow of air right there. And this is called glottal stop. We have this in the English word uh-oh, but we don't really use it anywhere else. And if you say uh-oh, you might even be able to feel that little bit of tightening in your throat. In other languages, though, this is just a consonant like any other that occurs in lots of words, like the, the standard Arabic uh, ektubu, I write, or the Hawaiian name for Hawaii, Hawaii. The glottal stop is written as an apostrophe, historically here. In, in Hawaiian, the glottal stop is called okina, which begins with the glottal stop, and you get it in, in handy words like humu humu nuku nuku apu a a. That's a kind of fish in Hawaii. And if this looks familiar to you, it's because you see it on some of the classroom scenes in uh, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. You can spot it up on the screen. The glottal stop in Klingon is also written with the apostrophe, like at the end of the word kapla. It doesn't just end in an ah, it ends in an ah that abruptly cuts off with that glottal stop. Now the k in nukne and the k in kapla are different sounds. Uh, the e one written with the lowercase q is a stop, and the uppercase q is something called an affricate that begins by cutting off the flow of air, but instead of, of just going directly into a vowel, there's some tightness there that causes frication, uh, roughness in, in the airflow that we can hear. English has some affricates like ch and j. So kapla uh, is something that you might use to wish success to a warrior headed off to battle. Now around this point, people might be going k, p, to, wait, hang on. You said there's no k sound, so uh, how do you say Klingon? And this was something that Mark Ogren gave some thought to. We talked a moment ago about affricates like ch or j, and there are other affricates around the word world. One of them is kl. It starts with the tip of your tongue pressed against that alveolar ridge behind your teeth, where English speakers say t or d, and then you lower the sides of your tongue and let air flow over them. Tla, tla. This sound, uh, again, is not common in Europe. Okran tried to go beyond the European languages that were familiar to English speakers, but you'll see, see quite, a bit of, quite a number of these languages in, say, the northwestern United States. But what happened when people whose languages used tla came into contact with people who had languages that didn't use them? Well, when European explorers met people who called themselves the Tlamath, they transcribed that as Klamath with a K-L. And to this day, there are place names like Klamath up in the Pacific Northwest. Ogren thought it was, would be plausible if there were people who called themselves Klingon, that perhaps some English speaker would initially write that down as Klingon, and that that would become the English word. Now, some people at around this point, too, these are some sounds that sound exotic to us if we've never heard of, heard them. And people might start wondering, well, if some of these languages do these, uh, have these strange sounds in them, are these languages themselves kind of strange? Are the people who speak them kind of strange? But the fact is that if you speak a language, everything in it seems normal to you. And our English sound th, like in think or the, in this, are actually very rare sounds worldwide. Uh, if you've ever met somebody learning English as a second language who said sink instead of think or da instead of the, that's because they were substituting a sound that they're more familiar with for one they hadn't yet learned to say. So we've got our share of unusual sounds too, from if you take a global perspective. So in Klingon, uh, this, this sound tl is spelled TLH. And the word for Klingon is Klingon. You'll notice, by the way, that the I is uppercase. That's meant as a reminder to say this is I instead of E. Klingon. Klingon also has its own grammar. You can't just take the Klingon dictionary and start flipping through it, looking up words, put them together in the same order that they would be in in English, and have a correct, uh, Klingon, um, correct Klingon sentence. To talk about grammar, we're going to talk a little about subjects, verbs, and objects. And I know for a lot of people, this is probably something you last talked about in sixth grade and haven't thought about since then. 
so we'll do a quick review. In English, we put the three in this order. And if you have a sentence like, the officer read the book, it's not a very Klingon concept. You can say it, but maybe a better sentence would be, the officer shot the book. Officer is the subject. That's the person who's doing things. The verb is what they're doing. And the object is what gets it done to. So the officer is the subject, shot is the verb, and book is the object. In Klingon, this is pak bachta yash. Uh, pak is book, that's the object, so it comes first. Bachta is the verb, that's what's happening. And yash is the subject, that's the officer. So the Klingon order is the opposite of the English. It's object, verb, subject. The English order, like everything else in English, seems very natural to us. But in fact, worldwide, this isn't the most common ordering of these three elements. The most common is subject, object, verb. If we look at this map, you'll see a couple of them in Europe, but most of these languages are somewhere else. The subject, verb, object ordering that we have is the most common with European languages, such as English, but is also very common in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and some parts of South America. Verb-first languages, as you can see, are rarer. Verb subject object is more common than verb object subject. And when we start looking at the object first languages, these are the rarest ones of all. Object verb subject is the very rarest with only four languages that do it. And that's the ordering that Okrin chose for Klingon. Since it's the rarest way that you can arrange these three elements, it also makes it feel the most alien. In a sentence like Klingon mach, we are Klingons. We is the subject, and so it occurs last. Klingon mach. Now you might also be thinking back just a little bit and saying, wait, hang on. You said that Mark Okrud created Klingon for Star Trek III, but wasn't there a bunch of Klingon in Star Trek motion picture? There's a whole scene with the, on the Klingon ship where they're speaking Klingon. And in fact, that wasn't created by Okrud. It was created by James Dewan, the actor we best know for Scotty. He spoke into a tape recorder. Mark Leonard listened to it, and when he was playing the Klingon commander as opposed to playing Spock's dad, he recorded it. But Dewan didn't create any sort of grammar for the language or say which parts of the sentences meant what. When Okrand came onto the project for Star Trek III, he wanted to make sure that his Klingon was compatible with James Dewan's Klingon. So first, he sat and listened over and over again to that scene, transcribing everything that he heard and writing down the sounds. And then he started thinking, how might we break this apart? Which parts of this mean what? In a, in a command like, cha yurush, stand by on torpedoes. What's being done? Stand by. That's the verb. What's it being done to? The torpedoes. That's the object. And typically in commands in English, we don't have a subject. It's kind of a short sentence. So you could so Okra deduce that uh, Klingon doesn't use a subject here either. We know that the object is going to be first, so that's cha, yehush is the verb, and Okrin broke that one down just a little farther too. Rush means stand by, and ye is a prefix that turns that verb into a command. Now you've probably heard about people doing things like translating Hamlet into Klingon. That's possible in part because even though Okrin created lots of Klingon words, he also created rules that let you form new ones based on the ones we already have. Linguists call this kind of word formation morphology, specifically derivational morphology, where we're creating new words from uh, roots and other uh, meaningful elements. So if you take an English word like unbelievability, even if you had never heard this word, if you know what believe means, you can figure it out by combining the way that, that all of these other component parts work. And Klingon will do the same thing. In a word like Roldu Kokraj, your so called beards. It's a very rude thing to say. Rol is beard. Du is a plural ending. It's only used for body parts. Kok means so called. And Raj is your. It's your if it refers to a group of people, not just one. And instead of having a separate word like we have in English, it uses a suffix for this. There are other languages that come up with long compound words of this sort. 
I'm going to take a deep breath and take a crack at this one. Czechoslovakia, Jalit, Lilashtira, Madlik, Larumis, Don Musiniz. Barely got through it on one breath. This is uh, Turkish, and it means, are you one of the people whom we couldn't make into a Czechoslovakian? If you have gotten interested in the Klingon language from this, well, your next stop really should be to look at Mark Okren's The Klingon Dictionary. It is a dictionary. You can look up um, English to Klingon, you can look up Klingon to English, but it also includes all of the basic grammatical rules of Klingon. There's even a phrase list at the end of, thing, of lines from movies or other things that you might want to be able to say, to say. It's sold well, so your library will probably have a copy, but go ahead and invest in one, either a physical one or an Amazon ebook or wherever ebooks are sold. And if you have any questions for me, you can reach me on Twitter or you can go to my website, tracycanfield.com. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. I hope you enjoy the rest, rest of the conference. Live long, prosper, and hop lot.